Hello everybody and welcome back to another spoiler review with me, a Border Prince. Today we are talking about Korax, Lord of Shadows, which is the 10th book in the Primarch series. We're already at number 10. So again, it is set during the Great Crusade and I think what Guy Haley's done here is really add a great deal of depth to the character of Korax, which again, I'm behind slightly on uh, Horus Heresy stuff, so this is really added to it for me. I don't know if any of the newer books have... I know that they've delved into this kind of thing a bit more, but he always struck me as a boring character. But this this is probably one of my favourite of the uh, Primark series so far. Yeah, this, the uh, Perturabo one and the Lorgo one are the top three for me at the moment. But anyway, let's get straight into it. We begin with him and Gilliman having some time together, some brotherly time. It's set just uh, a couple of years, about a decade or so, after Korax has been reunited with the Emperor when uh, Deliverance and uh, Kievar have been embraced into the fold of the Imperium. So it's a relatively short time from, for them, the fall of Old Knight and the Revolutionary War, which came to a, an end just prior to the Emperor arriving there. Now, they're using like a hollow suite, uh, very much, you know, Star Trek-esque, but one that you have to, you know, insert yourself in with a bunch of cables and stuff. It's like uh, next generation VR stuff. You know, this is where VR's heading. And Gilliman has a nice comment. He says, our ancestors must have had a difficult time staying in reality when they had this at their disposal, which I thought was a nice touch. You know, uh, it shows Gil <laughs> Guy Haley's grasp on sort of the way science is going, which is a lot. And OK, we'll get we'll talk about Guy Haley at the end. We'll get into the story. Basically, it's them playing a bunch of games together, uh, testing each other, fighting a game of Galactic Conquest. Uh, how this game is interpreted, basically, it's a completely realistic thing. So they, they must obviously insert data or information into it to generate this, this map where they each command a force. Now, it appears that uh, it's based on their current, uh, the, the amount of forces they currently have at their disposal. So Gilliman is always at a massive advantage. And this is what they discuss afterwards. Obviously, Gilliman wins most of these contests within the game. But um, get, the way Gilliman... And I think it's a clever bit of uh, writing there to to use Gilliman. Because we all know Gilliman to a greater or lesser extent. We know he is the stoic ideal, I guess you'd say, of what a Primarch is supposed to be. So we, we've got him as a base. So anything he says... And anything Korax says, you understand that from a base of, you know, the standard stoic warrior god, uh, warrior champion of humanity, you have then juxtapose that with Korax. So anything Gilliman says to him here is based on, on, on Gilliman's position as that sort of stereotypical champion of humanity, you know? Um, the reason why ultramarines are boring, <laughs> because they are just, you know, good. <laughs> the, the, the closest thing you're going to get to good guys, I guess. Um, so with them discussing the, the, how they fought against each other, it's an interesting area that Gilliman comments on the fact that, well, you know, I am a general. That's my, you know, that's what the emperor made me to be. And Korax isn't that. Now you can get into, I won't get into a whole thing of, you know, like how the Emperor used, uh, the stole the power of the gods to create the Primarchs and the science involved and all that, and how they're, they're aspects of his own nature. All that stuff, you know, we, we all kind of know that, so you know where I'm heading with this. Keep that in mind though. But Gilliman says, I suppose you, you are an insurgent, you know, you're a, a force for revolution, for change, for justice, and this gets into a whole conversation of uh, the relationship and throughout the book of how he wants to distance, Korax wants to distance himself from Co uh, Comrade Kurzes and how he is very, very similar in many ways, but Korax doesn't want to be through the, you know, he doesn't want to be associated with the Night Lords because he doesn't want to use terror. It's like he wants to be, he's, he's pushed towards being this force for nobility, for good. Kind of. <laughs> and we'll see how that plays out later on but they have an interesting discussion they have a fantastic discussion about you know the merits of each of their their ways of approaching things so Gilliman says you know I mean obviously if it comes to an empire versus empire conflict I win because that is what I am built to do that is my natural that's where all my natural skills and abilities my inclinations head me towards to run empires which is obviously shown in the fact that he has Ultramar and, and his later activities throughout the heresy and afterwards. He's an empire builder, very much in the sort of Roman sense of things. Whereas Korax is a force for liberation. For, Korax is the, is Spartacus. 
to is <laughs> yeah, Corax is, is Spartacus to Gilliman's Augustus, if you follow. I think that's a good way of looking at it. And you know, they for instance as well, there's a nice touch, and I think it links quite well to um stuff that's happened actually in the forty second millennium. Gilliman says at one point, you know, uh, uh, the use of your loaned assassins and infiltrators is something that I would I'm gonna incorporate into my legion. It's a tactic that you know, they're, they're unstable and you're not necessarily going to get the results you want, but the, the merits of using this sort of force is, uh, outweigh any costs. You know, it's definitely worth me integrating a similar force within my, my legion. Which interestingly, I don't think it was intentional, probably not. I'm probably looking too deeply into it, but if you look at the rivers that now exist within the Primaris formations, I can see that as a Gilliman, uh, when he was organizing this with Belisarius Corps, to integrate a similar sort of force there. I mean, I might be just talking bullshit here, probably am, but I can see that as a sort of mirror of that and how it's slightly possibly linked. But anyway, after we have this chat, uh, we move forward, but I don't want to move forward into the main storyline first. I'm going to cover the sort of the sub, the sub storyline. Uh, the book is after this moment, um, where they, and it's an amazing moment, you know, where they, dis- they, they discuss the origins of this, uh, this, virtual reality tool that was found a relic of the dark age that's been repaired with uh imperial machines which are twice the size of the components of the original you know because the imperium's just sort of scrubbing around doing its best to work with this advanced technology they happen to find now and again i love this period because it has all that because the great crusade is just after the fall of old night you have these ancient human civilizations which have survived the fall of uh, the human empire and the age of strife and they have these relics of technology and stuff it's like it is it's star trek on steroids you know hardcore star trek uh going to different worlds and mean oh look at this human civilization look at that spiraled off from the sort of the main current of human society and evolved into the over 10,000 years evolved into this new thing and taken on all these different cultural aspects, but they're all still fundamentally the same, which is something that is, is mentioned later on by another character, which we're going to get into, which is probably one of the best characters in the book. But I want to just go into this sub story on what's happening about what's happening on Kiavar and uh, on deliverance and the events that have transpired since Korax and the Legion left the planet to join the great crusade i think this is a fascinating thing it's as, just as important as the main storyline uh the, the battles and whatnot but i think it speaks a lot more to the problems inherent in the imperium and um, with the imperial truth and some of the hypocrisy that's involved there and this is what a lot of characters sort of uh, say towards the end and we'll get to that so for those who don't know just briefly uh Korax was born on the prison prison moon of lyceus and Lysaeus would later be renamed Deliverance and would become the fortress monastery of the Raven Guard Legion. He conducted a revolutionary war, guerrilla war, where they fought against the prison guards, the, the authorities which ruled the prison planet. So how it would work is uh, you were a prisoner, you would be sent off to Lysaeus on the, from the planet Kiovar, which was ruled by the tech guilds. Now you could be sent there for anything, not necessarily a, a grievous crime, but you and your, so you and your children that you would have on Lysaeus would be, you know, banished, exiled forever. You would never be allowed to return. Once you're sent to the prison moon, there is no return. You are doomed to stay there and your children are doomed to stay there in penal servitude. And this is where, like, uh, Korax was, was found, was, uh, was thrown to after his time in the warp, after they, uh, the Chaos Gods took them from the Emperor, or the Emperor let them go, whichever interpretation you want to go for. So that's where, that's where he grew up. It's again, the question of, were the Primarchs genetically predisposed to the, the kind of attitudes and personality that they had, or was it based on circumstance? Or was it a mix of the two, with some of them being more corrupted by Chaos, and uh, the sort of emotions of that, or is that simply based on the, the, their origins, their creation, and how the Emperor created them has instilled them with a certain characteristics? It's a fascinating area, and one that, as and when, sort of more information... I don't feel like it's it's in a position yet to make it like a law video and stuff, and it's more speculation at the moment, but as soon as we get more information for it, and I think as soon as we finish this Primark series and the arc of the Horus Heresy. We'll get a lot more answers from this. I think they have to give it us. They're probably going to try and give it a more ambiguous tone. So there's still room for interpretation. But I think the interpretations we're going to be able to pull from all of this lore collected when it's 
He's finally at that point where, you know, uh, the emperor is sent to the throne. Most of the Primarchs are either dead or scattered or broken and thrown off to the warp. We'll get a lot more information on this stuff and it, it's going to be really interesting. I'm looking forward to it. So Korax led this revolutionary war. They took over Deliverance. Uh, he formed, using uh, terrorist tactics, you know, insurgents tactics because of the sort of the power differential between the two forces. Korax is revolutionaries against the sort of the state, a uh, highly militarized society, a prison guard society, basically, that ruled over this slave population, fundamentally, um, who worked in factories and mining and so on. So it ended in him dropping atomic mines that were used, obviously, in the uh, the industrial processes on Lysaeus uh, deliverance and dropping them on the planet below, forcing their capitulation. And then shortly afterwards, the emperor arrived revealed himself to Korax, showed him his true origins and uh, gifted him his legion. They're most of Korax's followers, as is common with most of the Primarchs, they all joined the legion. Uh, many of them died, but many of them survived. So he had a lot of his sort of original core of loyal people around him. And we'll get to the implications of that later on. But basically he had a, a the legion already existed, obviously, and he became its commander. So... The Children of Deliverance are a terrorist insurgents group on Kiovar, and they have a number of operatives, a number of people who were loyal to them, who were over in the sort of the organization of the planet. And in the in the thirty years since the 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 unification, the compliance, not much has changed really. Many of the ideals and the hopes and dreams of many of the people who fought with Korax, and we assume Korax himself have not materialized. The population are fundamentally the same. The tech guilds still rule. They are still the top of the pyramid below the Adeptus Mechanicus who were given, what would you say, dominance of the of the population, dominance of the planet, overlordship, I should say, of the planet. So it's basically a, a part of the compliance was the Mechanicum would become overlords of Kiva, whereas the, the Legion itself would have deliverance and its environs and populations and so on. But of course, after the, before or during the, all of this victory and Korax becoming the supreme, taking over the supreme leader of this, this sector, this territory, uh, and then obviously he left. This is the, that was the nature of things. That was the, the order of things. But with the tech guilders still in charge, there was a lot of resentment at that because the sort of fundamentals of the society were not overturned. And, Many of the people from Lysaeus returned to Kiovar, which is somewhere where their ancestors, you know, were probably exiled from, thinking that they would have a better life. They didn't. There was a lot of cultural baggage there. They were looked down upon as worse than the menial workers of Kiovar were already, who, you know, were subservient to the tech guild members. And it's, it's a fascinating view of a population functions after this kind of war, this kind of changing of the order. And the fact that for the sake of stability and the greater needs of the Great Crusade and humanity, Korax did not perform the sort of revolutionary reshaping of this fragment of humanity, which had created its own society, and left it all pretty much in place, which is a sign of the hypocrisy and the fact that, and I think it, it's, it's interesting for those of us who study history and sociology and, uh, you know, politics and stuff like this. Again, I think this shows Guy Haley's great grasp on humanity, on history, on all of these aspects. I, I think he's a really intelligent guy and it's fun that he's thrown these things in there and it adds a depth to things that I think are lacking in a lot of novels, particularly the older ones. It was very much just sci-fi fun. This is sci-fi fun as well, but it's got an edge of cleverness to it. And I know that some people don't like Guy Haley. I'm not saying you're not wrong. I, I understand your arguments. I disagree. I think he's a fantastic writer, and I think he's one of the best. Josh Reynolds is still the funniest, but I think Guy Haley is is a monster. He's churning this stuff out, but he's managing to integrate really clever arguments and ideas and interesting shit in there, which I don't think any other author would manage to integrate quite as well. That's the sort of state of things. So one of Korax's old comrades from the sort of this revolutionary war, he decides to begin attacking the state again because he wants to overturn the order because he wants to he wants Korax to be aware of the suffering of the people of Lysaeus, of the crumbling of their ideals, of the fact that they have not got what they originally thought they were fighting for, and 
I guess we'll we'll let we'll save that sort of confrontation till the end because eventually he does meet Korax and they go over this and it's a fascinating discussion. Uh yeah, fantastic. So we meet this operative who is assassinating guilders, uh launching terrorist attacks, bombings and so on. And really it's it's an insurgency, an underground insurgency with these highly skilled operatives. Very much if you've seen the Jackal or many of the sort of colonial insurgencies and so on that happened sort of in the, the 20th century, you'll be aware of what it's, it's aiming at. You, you've seen this kind of thing before. And again, I think that points to the sort of commonality in humanity that very much, uh, you know, things, they happen and they happen again. It's an interesting view. And again, shows, God, hell, he's amazing. This. I'm sucking his dick. I don't care. <laughs> so she's launching a bunch of terrorist attacks. And eventually the authorities become aware of this because, you know, civilian casualties are rising. It's affecting the stability of the situation. It's affecting the the output of the planet. It's having a detrimental effect and it's embarrassing as well. So the, the mechanic can become involved. The Legion become involved in tracking down this insurgency. And eventually they do find it. And it turns out that obviously it's this operative, a young girl who was descended from Lysaeans, who came to the planet and attempted to, you know, prosper, to take advantage of the of the the dividend of the victory, of the freedom of the Lysaeans, and the apparent end of the injustices of the past, the tyranny of the past, ruled by the tech guilds, and they found were found wanting. They didn't get this, they couldn't find work, they suffered more probably, or just the same as they did before. So all of the sacrifices, all of the ideals were for nothing. This girl ends up in prison, she's recruited by the children of deliverance, which are the the sort of uh, descendants, the, 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 the follow-on organisation from Korax's original insurgency. People who potentially were too old to become members of the Legion, or didn't want to, who fundamentally disagreed on an ideological ground of what the the emperor is what the imperium is and how the they have allowed this organization this society to continue to function fundamentally you know there's been some some bits of freedom given to the people but fundamentally the the tech guilders still rule the 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 workers are still workers and the lycaeans are still underneath the normal sort of working class of this planet it's brilliant it's brilliant and that's what happens. So she becomes recruited. She becomes a, a, a very well-trained killer and insurgent using the techniques that uh, these people learned from Korax or developed during their time with Korax. And it's ruled by this one dude who used to be a member. Now he's getting old and he's doing this basically to, in his mind, he wants to confront Korax and show him and tell him that he is wrong, that he has been lied to, that he has been tricked. This is not the world, the future that they were fighting for, that so many of them suffered for. And he feels cheated. So it's by saying that Korax feels cheated, uh, Korax has cheated them, has lied to them, he's a hypocrite. He feels like that as well because he's, fanat he's a fanatic. He is an insane. He is a believer, a true believer. He's completely sane. It's just he has a completely different mindset to the... He is opposed to the Imperium. He is opposed to the world that they are trying to create and the fact that they have stopped them from making a better future for his people. And this is something that gets called upon later on. One of the uh, the Astartes who joins the investigation into this organization who are trying to track them down, he also says at one point, well, if I wasn't an Astartes, I'd be trying to kill Gilders. You know, like, I don't forgive these people. They made us suffer. Which again, it, I mean, it's brilliant. It's the fact that even now, this guy, it's only because he's been ordered not to that he isn't going off killing these people either. So you can see that, that you can imagine how powerful that is amongst the sort of general population, the resentment that's there. And I just want to talk briefly about Kirvar because I think it's, I think it's a great thing that Guy Haley has done here that he's shown this post dark age technology, uh, society. There's nice little elements in there. For instance, he's looking at a sign at one point and it's, it's written in the, the naive style. Apparently it's like they've taken it some artistic method but to me, it sounds like a warning sign, you know, like it's, it's sort of the things you'd see written on a wall to explain a situation, you know, uh, with hieroglyphs, he says, <laughs> but it sounds like they're just sort of what emojis, basically, you know, warning signs, you know, like wear your hard hats and stuff, which that's what I thought it was. I might be wrong here, but I thought it was a nice touch that over the years, the original meaning has been lost and it is now sort of some high form of art or from some distant ancient form of art. 
<laughs> Whereas before, it was probably just a don't litter here or, you know, stay within the lines <laughs> as you're walking through the factory. Stuff like that. You get a nice view of their, the tech guilder's relationship with the Adeptus Mechanicus. So at one point, one of the tech guilders says, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter who builds, it doesn't really matter who builds what on, on Kiavar anymore, as long as the Mechanicum are in charge. You know, like, it doesn't really matter anymore. We're building things for the Mechanicum, for the Great Crusade. That's it. And it's interesting to see the, the Mechanicum's view on this planet. They were given suzerainty. Uh, they were given, you know, dominion of this world. And they agreed to this because the Kiavarans have, tech guilders have managed to maintain certain bits of ancient technology. But they are worried that if they conducted a full purge of this, these guilds and took over completely, they would lose access to this, which is probably true through damage or, you know, vandalism. If they went around storming around, taking out the guilds, the guilds would probably destroy the secret knowledge that they have that's been passed down to them for generations. Also, we see the sort of disgust <laughs> of, of the Kiavarans to the Mechanicum to see these half machine people running around. And this, this, this is called on a few times, and I think it's a nice touch throughout the book. The Kiavarans have not degenerated as the tech priests have, as the, as the tech priests of Mars has, because they don't view, they didn't suffer in the same way as the, uh, as the rest of humanity did to the Iron Men, to AI, you know, to the cybernetic wars and so on. We get a hint that they, they did to an extent, but they clearly managed to defeat that threat. There's old stories told to them, apparently, by their, their grandparents, you know, horror stories passed down of the time when humanity's servants turned on them. So they obviously have some historic memory of these events, but it's so long ago, and they obviously did had a better time of defeating this threat than others did. They were lucky, you know, uh, their, their sort of technological base was to a greater or lesser extent maintained and they were able to maintain a fairly high level of technology uh, without falling into uh, a religious belief in in machine spirits and that sort of stuff. So it's a nice touch. He's really built the world here. I've got a great feeling for Kiovar, which is something I didn't get. You know, I've read those books where Korax was, they have covered Korax in the heresy, at least sort of early on. Uh, you know, about his, his project to create his own space marines and so on. And I don't feel like I got a full grasp of his situation and his origins. It sort of went straight into it. And I feel that this has really enriched Korax and the Raven Guard to me in a way that wasn't there before and their origins. And I'd like to know what's happening with Kiovar now, uh, in the 41st millennium. I don't know if there's been any books covering that, but I would like to see how this society has continued to evolve and whether they have either lost control of their sort of tech base, if, whether the tech guilds exist still, or whether they were ultimately subsumed within the Mechanicum. The Mechanicum sort of eventually lost patience and went in there after the tech. I don't know. I'm interested to find out though. Uh, and whether there's still sort of like a, a sort of nascent resistance to the Imperium. It'd be interesting to find out what's happening right now. And maybe we will one day, because Korax is blatantly going to come back. Because <laughs> apparently this is another short story uh, with him hunting down people in the Eye of Terror, which I will get to and I'll do a review of soon. That's what's going on there. And eventually, obviously, the ringleader of this operation, this resistance, is sent to Korax. And that's where they meet at the end of the book. But the main strand of the story is the war for the system of Karanai. This is the opportunity that the Great Crusade offers them. And I think they're definitely going to go back there and revisit this and add more depth to stuff in the years ahead. The Great Crusade offers them the chance to create awesome stuff that you would normally see in Star Trek. It offers them a chance to add flavor and culture to humanity, to work on the sort of, or to do everything they could possibly want to do about how humanity would, would change in the universe based on events and how it wouldn't necessarily be a unified culture. And it is to a greater or lesser extent fairly uniform across the Imperium. It isn't, but there are intergalactic organizations which provide a sort of a cultural base across the Imperium. The Ecclesiarchy, the Administratum, uh, the military organizations, obviously. They'll create a sort of a base level of Imperium culture, of human culture. And you don't have that in the Great Crusade. So, you know, there's a need for translators because not everybody speaks Imperial Gothic as a first or second language. It's, you know, you can see how... 10,000 years of isolation or relative isolation and the the things that these societies have been through, wars, colonizations, 
you know, devastation, devastating events and so on. You can see how they've, they've spoiled off on different directions, but they're very much still sort of similar. There is a sort of general standard humanity. And I, there's only, uh, as one of the characters mentions in this, there are extremes, but they're generally in the minority. There, you know, there are societies that went full on technological, became cybernetic abominations and all that sort of stuff, or went full on feral, you know, became cannibalistic, barbaric societies and stuff like that. But in general, a lot of the time, the, the population is kind of generally still around the same level, you know, intellectually and technology and, and technologically. And, you know, they're comparable to the Imperium and they, they all have this common origin, obviously. So that, that helps with that. But this is where we get to Karanoi. Now, Karanoi is, a, again, fascinating. It's a giant star with a bunch of giant, um, moons around it. It's moonlets, planetoids of human manufacture. There are like a thousand of these planet moons. And the, uh, the sort of the origin story of this is, uh, it's Karanoi lies upon a very stable warp route to another part of the galaxy. So it's, it's kind of like a gateway, you know, um, and it acted as sort of like a trading post. There's nothing there. It's just this star. I mean, there might be asteroids and shit around, but they all orbit this star, taking advantage of the, the energy it gives off using ancient forms of technology. And they're all man-made and no one's quite sure how all of the, the resources got there to build all these mini moons and all that stuff. But, they're all there. There's these thousands of, 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 of little individual planets, like countries. So it is like a normal planet, except it's probably bigger. It has a bigger population and it's more powerful because each of these obviously has its own fleet. They've had wars in the past between different factions within there, different alliances. And, you know, some of them are ruled by princes. Some of them are ruled by what appears to be electri- elected representatives, I guess. You know, it's, it's, each of them is different. Some of them have princes, some of them have lords. It's brilliant. Again, it's like a microcosm of the Imperium. You have all of these different planets. <laughs> they are planets fundamentally. And how they've, they're all culturally distinct. Um, they have their own form of garb and that incorporates their sort of, the position of their planets, uh, which is something Korax deduces, like the, the way they wear beads and things like this on their, on their uniforms, on their clothing. Sorry, the biggest pile of bikes ever has just gone past my house. They, have all this clothing and it sort of represents their position of their planet in terms of uh, where it sits in orbit. And all of these things are like based, they're they're arranged by treaty. All of the fascinating society, fascinating human culture. Now, unfortunately for them, survivors from a previous compliance arrive at Karanai before them and tell horror stories and, you know, completely accurate horror stories, as it turns out, of the forced compliance of the previous uh, target of this expeditionary fleet. Now, Admiral Fink is a fantastic character. The way he describes how he, he meets Korax, his own sort of internal feelings and thoughts, because he can't say them to anyone, because that would be dangerous to his career, is brilliant, is, is stunning. And I definitely, oh, he's a highlight of this book, uh, surprisingly. Again, I think it's in one of the previous novels. I think it was the um, the one by Dan Abnett, uh, the first one where we had the, the Alpha Legion showing up. I forget what it's called now. But they, these expeditionary commanders, these are world conquerors in their own right, you know. They control these massive armies, obviously. But in another setting, in another situation, these would be you know, you're Genghis Khan, you know, the, you're, you're Napoleon. These are great men. These are awesome war figures. They are generals beyond compare. It's just in comparison to the emperor, to the primarchs and to the space marine commanders. They aren't on that level. They don't shine through as much, but you know, you can see why these guys would be given entire worlds and systems to, to rule and why a lot of the descendants of imperial governors in the current setting of the 41st millennium, in the 42nd millennium, I should say, they are descended from these great men, you know, these imperial commanders. It's great. It's brilliant. And it really, it's helping to build that picture of, I mean, I hope, I hope following the heresy, they really do some work in sort of showing how these, uh, the, how this society functions, how he, the imperium 
from where it ends at the in the ashes of the heresy, how the Imperium sort of coalesces properly. I think it's going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope they do that. And we've got it's like this right in this this stuff. I think they will put the work into to generate that that vision of the Imperium, how it reemerges from the heresy with this with all of these characters and the, the, how they're, they're they're positioned within the the society that forms the civilization that forms afterwards. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. What he does what is he goes and tries to conduct the compliance in a sort of normal way. They have overtures. They send remembrances out there as diplomats and so on. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't go well with these guys because of their knowledge of the Imperium that they gain from this, this group of refugees who come in from the previous expeditionary targets who survive and flee. And that's a problem as well. That That's a failing on their part that they allowed that to happen. But it's a bloody compliance and obviously horror stories have reached the, the Karanoians. And they are... Uh, they're not a united group. Um, they're all, all sort of self-governing. Uh, there's all factions and alliances and stuff like that, as you can imagine from a society like this, from any human society with multiple multiple spheres of influence, like on a, on a planet would be. As we look at now, if the Imperium came to Earth now, there would be lots of internal conflict. And it would again, it's that whole thing of how would humanity unite from an external threat? That's it. And that's what we see here. They sort of coalesce and unite against the Imperium. And the Imperium obviously demands compliance. And their argument is that, you know, you join us and the opportunities for trade and advancement for yourselves is unsurpassed. You will have the entire Imperium to become part of and to grow rich on. But the Karanoians love their independence too much. And obviously they, they know the other side of the Imperium. And eventually they lose patience and they the emissaries of the Imperium, they cut their tongues out and cut their hands off and send them back to the expeditionary fleet. Fenk, seeing this as a grave insult, requests the Night Lords because he knows they will come and fucking punish them harshly. And that's what he wants. He needs to deliver a message. Um, and he thinks that obviously the initial onslaught that the Night Lords would unleash, supporting his own forces, would um, perhaps force the rest of them to bend the knee quicker. He wouldn't have to kill them all. They they would bend the knee quicker once they see what happens to a few of them. So using terror and fear to force the compliance, which is a standard tactic, which is a reasonable tactic if you look at it. So that's that's where things stand. Of course, he doesn't get the Night Lords. He gets the Raven Guard. And that's a different kettle of fish. But I want to just talk about Fenk before we move on. Fenk has an excellent sort of inner monologue where he, uh, after he's met Korax and so on, he needs to learn who Korax is because as one of his old masters once told him as his old commander once told him before he retired each of the Primarchs is like an old god you know and Guy Haley slips in this little comment um you know you you learn how to worship your god from your mother's knee with your mother's milk which is very old I mean oh god you know if you if <laughs> if you're an internet person not like me because I'm not really but you know what I mean? You, you've read all these things back in the day, you know, when all that fucking atheist shit was going on. Um, yeah, it's it's a nice touch to slip that in. Guy Haley knows what he's doing. I do like him. I do write, like his writing. I do like how he incorporates this stuff. But, but Feng's thing is, you know, he needs to... You need to... You need to go towards a Primark as you would one of the old gods in order to get their, their favour and to get them to listen to you. You need to obfuscate yourself before them. And at first, Fink thinks that this is a sort of a, a terrible travesty. It's a terrible thing. It's a it's a knock against the imperial truth, the secular truth. But as the years have gone on and he's met with Primarchs, he realises the truth of this. <laughs> they are gods, fundamentally, and that's how you need to approach them. And that's what he does in this. But he sees that Korax is arrogant. He's arrogant. And he's self-righteous. And that this is what's going to cause all the problems for them in this compliance Fenk just wants them to do an all-out attack to show the strength of the Imperium that they cannot resist them. But Korax goes about it in this really weird ideological way that he wants to prove how he uh, they're not going to use terror against these people. They're going to do like force them to bend the knee. And he's obviously got an, an antipathy to the lords. He's very much against the noble class there. And that's causing a problem in terms of their their diplomacy causes a massive problem because he's not willing to give an inch in this. He expects complete dominion. Whereas Fenk's like, well, you know, you've got to be a bit more, you know, it's you've got to be a bit more politic about this. And he sees that Korax doesn't understand people. He can't see things from the other person's point of view because he is a fanatic as well. 
And the only difference is now from him, <laughs> from who he is now to who he was on Deliverance, is that he's been shown a, a better cause. He's still the same fanatic that he was then, the still the same idealist, still the same person capable of committing terrorist acts on civilians and so on. But his cause has changed. You know, he's a crusader who's got a new cause. And the new cause is the Great Crusade and the, the truths that have been revealed to him by the Emperor. The truths of, you know, chaos, the world, the universe, the survival of the species and so on. And that's where Thank comes in, though. Because Thank Fenk is the sort of, the normal person's view of this. And he, he shows this so, it's, it's so crystalline, it's beautiful, it's fantastic writing. So how it goes on from there is... Um, the not Raven God begin an initial attack. They have a stealthy attack on the planet. Oh, I should say, uh, they have an interesting part where they discuss the Ashen Claws, which for those who don't know, they are a, uh, a renegade chapter, I guess you'd say, of the Raven Guard. And they are descended from the Raven Guard who were exiled pretty much by Korax from the Legion. Um, they were the original Legionaries that were recruited on Terra. Uh, they were descended from slavers, basically. Um, ash slavers, I think it is. Something like that. And they had a predisposition to the same kind of combat style as the existing Raven Guards. Stealth and swift attack and all that sort of stuff. But they were slavers and they were far more vicious. And obviously because of their origins, Korax didn't like him. He didn't like him. He had instant revulsion to them. And that's one of the reasons why... And this is something that Fenk notices. There are very few Terrans in the Raven Guard Legion that he, he comes into contact with. And the only ones that are there are the ones who weren't necessarily descended from these guys. And we, we hear the story here. And I think it's been covered in other areas. But basically, it's, this is the best interpretation of it I've seen. A Terran commander is there. Fenk asks him, where's all the Terrans? And the Terran guy says, well, they all got exiled because they, they were far too vicious were far too similar to the Night Lord's way of doing things, of using terror and fear to succeed. And Korax purged them, basically. He sent them out into the wider universe ahead uh, on these uh, purge purge uh, <laughs> purgation, purgation fleets, which are forces that are sent out ahead of the main Imperial line of advance to just decimate Xenos forces and so on. With no sort of diplomatic area, not, not there for compliance or anything, they're there to exterminate Xenos races. And these guys exist into the current day, and there is rumours, of course, that they are the Carcharodons. Uh, there's a lot of lore there, and it's a nice touch to throw this in, but it explains why, in the best way, Korax got rid of these guys, which is nice. And obviously, Fenk is like shocked by this, <laughs> which is nice again. But also we get some other elements where the um, the Raven Guard are discussing Korax's approach to this and they're a bit disturbed by his attitude to these things and they confront him later on and he is furious that they dare to confront him on this. And it's just his whole attitude and his whole approach to this compliance is wrong because he doesn't understand why these people will not embrace a better way. But that's because he is a fanatic. You see, he's a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> and he's confronted later on, obviously. But we'll get into that. We'll get to that we'll, when he speaks to his old comrade from Lysaia, the one who was conducting the terrorist operations. So they conduct this stealthy attack on a, a number of targets, and it succeeds for the most part. And Korax believes that this will show the supremacy of the forces uh, that they're up against, that they can't win, that they need to surrender. But of course, he is a fanatic, and he can't understand that they are fanatically devoted to their own independence, their own existence as free people and he can't understand this he can't get it into his head because he's not built that way to understand this he is a force for change for revolution and that's the problem you know and that's the problem with all of the primarchs because they are so strong-willed because they are demigods that they they don't understand it from the other person's point of view which is troubling and again draws upon the conversations that Gilliman and he had there and and shows the, the difference in them and how the Primarchs are, oh, it's, it's great, it's fantastic. Before we go on with the main sort of story, again, we get some nice views of the Karanoi society, or at least some of their society on some of the moons. There was a nice touch with uh, showing how the seas function. They have vast reactors 
underneath the seas that they have created. The, the beauty of it, and I, again, this is just something that they can do on Great Crusade stuff that they probably can't get away with in other things because of the, the degradation of the technology. But here you can see it and it's great. It's imaginative. It's world building. The Carolines on this one moon, this one planetoid, they, <laughs> they keep the seas warm. All right. So the seas act as a coolant for the generators, but the heat that the generators give off heat the sea, enabling life to exist within the sea. Brilliant. Fucking brilliant. It's great. And uh, all sorts of different things about how their, their society functions, how the people are. Uh, the people, obviously, they live in, they live on these planetoids. So they're, they're taller and more spindly than normal humans are because they're living in this low gravity environment. Again, nice touch. Fantastic. The most vocal leader of the resistance to the Imperium, who sort of becomes basically the de facto leader of all of them, becomes Korax's main target. And he leads an attack there and we see him using his stealthy skills that he can make himself invisible. Uh, we also see him using his, his elite who have similar skills that have been passed on to them genetically through him. And they're going after this guy as well, part of a general attack. Now, this guy releases the Anima Phage, which is an ancient weapon, uh, the worst weapon, and is pretty much the thing that happens in Firefly. And I can't remember what the, that side of things, the, the zombie horrible dudes were called, but it's pretty much that, similar anyway. And the majority of the population are turned into slavering, frenzied zombie, fast zombies, they're fast zombies, uh, killers who come at the lone operatives and specialist forces that the, the Raven God have had. And, you know, it's brutal, it's terrible, these all, men, women and children turned into slavering, horrible creatures. But it's probably the wisest move you could make and it does disrupt their attack, obviously decimates the, this, this planetoid, his own people. He manages to escape and Korax goes on a madden seeing this. He loses so many of his best men, his most skilled operatives and so on in this. He has to rescue some of them himself, uh, coming in and saving them from the mobs uh, that are trying to overwhelm them. Uh, he has to kill so many. And this is after he's he's on a self-righteous little quest at the time going through. They're killing slavers and all this. Going like, oh, you know, we're all, you're all going to be free and all this sort of shit. And then this happens and it sort of ruins his whole plan. And he's furious. He's filled with zealous rage to hunt down and destroy this, this evil man. And he goes on a madden about it. And this is the problem because he... Instead of sticking with the main Imperial expedition and helping Fenk, he leaves basically on a, on a one man hunt. Well, to hunt down this one man without consideration for the greater strategy of the Imperial forces there. And this is what fucking pisses off Fenk. And Fenk's right. You know, like your plan's going to fail. They're going to resist you. This is what's going to happen. And that's exactly what happens. It's brilliant. So in the end, he finds him on a sort of hidden space station that's that's really close to the sun. Uh, he sends in his suicide troops and we get some nice view of them. We get some nice view of their origins. And these are the guys, fundamentally, it's the guys who suffer from the ash blindness or the, uh, the sable, uh, sable brand, I think it is. This is the degrada the degraded effect of the uh, Raven Guard gene seed where they, they suddenly become ash white. Their skin changes color. Their eyes become black, just like Korax. But they become morose, depressed, only thinking of murder. They have no sense of self-preservation. And uh, they they join up with those who become part of the Moritat. And the Moritat are part of the Great Crusade. They're suicide troops. They're the, the guys who slip past recruitment. Uh, murderers, psychopaths, and so on. Guys who are not virtuous, who are not honorable. They are fucking nuts. They love to kill. They're guys who should not have been integrated into the Legion, but because of the the necessity of keeping recruitment numbers up and recruiting more Astartes, a lot of undesirables made it in. And that doesn't happen so much in the chapters now. Um, there are occasionally guys who do slip through, but at the time of the Great Crusade, it was number, it was qu quantity, not quality. And the Imperium still found a use for these guys and used them quite effectively. So we have the one Raven God who starts to suffer from this. And in order to get him out of it, uh, they agree that, what well, his commanders agree, they offer him the opportunity basically to join the Moritat on their suicide attack on this space station. And that's what they do. Uh, they suffer 45% casualties, I think. It's grievous casualties. And casualties in any other force would be considered a terrible loss. But for the suicide troops, it's a perfectly acceptable. It's a really good result. And, and these vicious murderers and so on, the surviving ones, leave and uh, leave this place to fall to its doom slowly as its engines are knocked out and it gradually falls towards the sun's surface, burning up as it goes. 
Korax is on his command station, reveling to an extent in listening to the ravings of this ruler. Uh, I think it's Argoth, uh, um, Arch Com- Comptroller Argoth. And he's listening to him rave. And he waits until he starts to beg for help. That then he suddenly puts on a big broadcast so that everybody can hear. And he gives his self-righteous speech to this. You know, he's been ignoring everyone. He's been ignoring ha- cries for help. His entire fleet, this entire force of Astartes, this legion of Astartes has just been sat there. Self-indulgent. So he could be self-indulgently self-righteous as he destroys this meaningless opponent. The main battle is to take the, the, the to take the Sodality, to take Karanoi. And he doesn't care. He wants to just, he's getting his rocks off. He's getting his cummies punishing this one evil man. And it's like, it's fine. And I don't know whether I'm meant to take this from this, but it seems like a really arrogant thing to do. Um, completely missing the point of the Great Crusade, completely missing the point of this compliance. And Fenks continuously asking for help while he's sat there. And eventually, obviously, he gets, he gets, he gets what he wants from this emotionally, I suppose. And uh, then goes and joins the compliance, which turns out it to be just as bloody a compliance as everybody feared it would be. Without any of this messing around, it's taken longer and it's cost more because by Korax's actions and his attitude, he has you, un- he managed to unite the, the Karanoians together to resist the Imperium, which means that they all fight for survival. And it's a far grimmer process. Um, I should also mention that we meet a uh, force. I can't remember what they're called. But it's a commander called Felix. And he really gives us uh, a view of what the Karanoans suffer from. Uh, they, they're sheltering a group of survivors in some who didn't fall to the uh, animus thing. And they break out of there, believing that the Imperium are going to sterilize them or murder them or something. And it's a trick. And they all end up getting infected. Uh, so only a few of them survive. But they take these refugees on ships afterwards. But it's a great scene where you've got this horde coming towards them. And these guys are using... They're breacher troops. Uh, they're shipboarding troops. And I think they're wearing white armour. So in my mind, I've got the vision of like actual like Star Wars, Star uh, Stormtrooper star guys with big riot shields and stuff. And um, that they, they fight this fighting retreat to try and save themselves and save as many of the people as they can. And it, it's a great scene, and I don't want to—I don't want to not mention it because it is quality. And his character is also pretty nice, and I'd like to see him again. Yeah, it's good. His attitude towards the the Raven Guard as well, like he says that he's speaking to a captain. He's like, "Oh, he must be new here. He doesn't know who I am, you know." And I, I haven't learned. I don't know who he is. Captains come and go. There's loads of captains, you know. I might know chapter masters and stuff, but captains, eh? There's loads of them. Who cares? I am an important commander myself, <laughs> which is a nice touch. There's some nice elements of how the human, the normal Imperial Army troops have to assist in the compliances and garrisoning and stuff like that. And uh, their uh, relationship with the Astartes. And there's some other nice little bits and bobs that remind you that the tech priests are fucking crazy. And <laughs> their view of technology and everything. It's nice. It's a good touch. So the story ends with Korax and this veteran of his War of Revolution meeting. And the discussion they have is fascinating. And it fundamentally comes down to the guy says that basically Korax has been tricked into following the Emperor. The Emperor is a tyrant. He, on one hand, says about the Imperial truth. On the other hand, he brings the tech priests along with him. I think he says, like, uh, talking about the Imperial truth and out the other side of his mouth... Uh, giving the okay to the tech priests, uh, worshipping machines and stuff like this. And he say, even goes, worshipping machines? <laughs> it's abhorrent. And it's beautiful to show the sort of the cultural problems of meshing these populations together. Uh, yeah, Korax tries to explain himself. And one of his, one of his Astartes afterwards, uh, beforehand, I should say, uh, says like, I think you're going to try and justify yourself to him. And you shouldn't. You are Korax. You are a Primarch. You are my father. You don't need to justify yourself to him. But he still tries to. He still tries to because he's a fanatic. But the thing is, he is a fanatic completely. Like Lorgar. And this pulls a guy again on that uh, conversations he, he has with Gilliam at the start of the book where they're discussing the sort of the similarities and differences between all the different Primarchs and how a lot of them share very, they share traits. And again, whether these are things that have been drawn from the warp that represent the commonality of human consciousness or whether they're elements of the emperor's personality and, you know, his 
his genetic code or his spirit that was used to create them. I don't know, but it's fascinating nonetheless. But Korax does have the fanaticism of Lorgar. And in this case, originally that was completely devoted to a revolutionary war to free the people of deliverance from the from the tyranny of the people of Kele- of Kiavar, from the tech guilds of Kiavar. But he was presented with a greater cause. And so for him, the cause of deliverance, the cause of the people of Lysaeus, the Lysaeans, is meaningless now. It does not matter. They are now a small part of a greater struggle. So their freedom, their future is secondary. They must continue to suffer. I think he says, he says this himself. They must continue to suffer because we're fighting a bigger war. And obviously this guy, he's repulsed by this. He, he sees this as a betrayal and it is a betrayal. But then in the wider context of things, you're like, well, I see Korax's point, but at the same time, how does he justify that to himself? And this is the brilliantness of it. Korax, for me, in this book, has become a really fascinating character with a lot of spirit and a lot of interesting elements to him that I don't think he had before. He seemed like a quite cut-out, moody goth dude with power claws. Now, I see him in a new light. And I think that's one of the best things about these Primark books, that some of them have failed. Uh, the Salamanders one stands out for me. The Ultramar one, uh, the, the the Gilliman one, the first one stands out to me as ones that sort of failed to get this. But the the definitely the, the Perturabo one, uh, definitely the Lorgar one, which is by Gav Thorpe. And I'm not like always a big fan of Gav Thorpe's work, but that one, he, he pulled it out of the bag. Fantastic. These books really add to the characterization of these characters, the characterization of these characters, the depth of these characters, who they are, what makes them tick. And that obviously enriches how we view them in the heresy and afterwards and how that's their character has been passed on to their members of their legion. And I don't think that's carried through all the time, but it definitely adds a sort of, um, we know them, you know, we know what to expect and we know what sort of, cultures or morality they've managed to instill in their guys and it's interesting again then to see knowing that to see how individual marines are still different and how that conflicts with their own morality and their own sense of right and wrong and so on it's good man i mean i might be looking too much into this i probably am (laughs) but i don't give a shit this is this is fun and interesting and it pulls on so many different things and I really love Guy Haley's work. And again, he's pulled it out of the bag on this. Truly great. And I do heartily, heartily recommend it. I think I listened to this once and I was like, oh, that was okay. And then I, I went back and listened to it again in order to do this. I ended up listening to it like four or five times. It's mostly because I was going to the gym and shit. So I just had it on. But having listened to it a number of times, and again, it, that might be why I'm looking too much into it. Because <laughs> I've read it. Well, I've listened to it four or five times now. It is really, really interesting and deep. More so than I originally thought. I thought it was kind of lackluster at first, but having listened again, the character of Fenk, the things he says, Korax's attitude to things, how they make the decisions they do and how the characters, what their beliefs are and how they view things is great. It's it's set it above all the others for me and I think this is my favourite one. So I do recommend it. You should definitely get it. I'm looking forward to what happens with the next ones. I don't know. I don't think anything's going to come close to this for depth. And yeah, quality, truly quality. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed my ranting assessment of this book, my review of this book, the, my spoiler-ridden review of this book. Um, join me again next time. I'm going to be getting these out fairly regularly again. I know there's been a bit of a hiatus recently, but uh, yeah, the reviews will be coming fairly consistently now. And yeah, I'm not sure what the next one will be. I don't want to spoil it, but I'll, I'll put one out. It'll be for a shorter thing, but um, I might not do it in time. So I don't want to give you a date. Uh, if you want to support the channel, please use the links below. If you want to get this book, please use the links below. That all helps me and helps me make the uh, the channel better. And um, yeah, if you want mind giving this a like and share, if you want to share it somewhere. But also if you're not subscribed and you're listening to this for the first time, please do subscribe. I appreciate your support. And yeah, have a great week, I guess. I don't know when you're watching this, (laughs) but I'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. Cheers.